Assalamualaikum. Welcome to our Fatimiya special on Friday night on Ahlul Bayt TV and condolences to all those mourning the martyrdom of Hazrat Fatima. Salam alayha. Uh, with me is uh, Sheikh Osama Attar, who has uh, flown in from Canada directly uh, and immediately uh, has come to our studios um, to do a program. And tonight, inshallah, we're going to be looking at uh, correct conduct under different forms of oppression. It can be oppression of ourselves, oppression of relatives, people at work, or uh, other forms of, of tyranny. What is the correct conduct uh, that we should be uh, engaging in under difficult and oppressive um, circumstances? So I wanted to welcome him. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Um, there, there are a few um, definitions of, um, of oppression. Um, there is Turian. Tarhut, and also we have other definitions. Could you explain a little bit about the different definitions? Okay, there is, there is, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. We have the concept of dhulm, which is oppression. And that concept of dhulm can be divided into two uh, branches. One is the dhulm of nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about oppressing one's own self. And that's in, for example, Surah Ali Imran, verse 135, where Allah says, And those, uh, when they commit uh, an, an, a sin, or they oppress their own selves, and there by their own selves, uh, oppression of the own selves basically reflects the rights of the eyes, the ears, the tongue, and the whole limbs and organs of the body, on oneself, and these rights are outlined in the Charter of Rights by Imam Sajjad So when someone violates the rights of the eyes and, and, the, and the limbs and the organs of one's individual, then he's done dhulm nafs When mm -hmm. one does not obey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that are between him and Allah, for example, does not pray, or a person does not fast, then he's done dhulm mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have dhulm al the oppression against others. Basically taking the rights away from other individuals. This is not only transgressing on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disobeying Allah, but now it's transgressing on the path of others. The others could be human beings, could be other animals, as a matter of fact. Many, many years ago, we have Ahlul Bayt speaking of animal rights, you know, uh, yeah. and, and now we have those animal rights activists and whatever. For example, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, he never t uh, hit his uh, camel that he rode during, uh, when going to Hajj mm -hmm. for many years. And, 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 and he said, this, this naqa, this camel, he told his son, Imam al Baqir, when he was dying, Imam al-Sajjad was dying, he told him, bury this camel when it dies. Because many times it's joined me in Hajj. Okay, so he takes extreme care, you know, of, of the camel that, you know, was his companion in Hajj, yeah. or that he took to Hajj. So there is the animal rights. And then, of course, there are the human rights. You know, a person, for example, lying to another individual. Now that not only this individual has transgressed on the path of Allah, but now has also transgressed on the path of others. And for this, one needs to seek forgiveness from the individual to whom he lied, and also from Allah right. subhanahu wa ta'ala, because now there are two components here to the, to, to, the, to the sin. So this is the concept of dhulm in very general, general term here. Now you refer to the word taghut. That, that word is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah in, in, in just a couple of verses after Ayat Al-Kursi. لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله and so on and so forth. So the طاغوت is of course the, the, the oppression or the tyranny or the, the extreme of course طاغوت is, is, is like ملكوت which is the extreme oppression right. there including for example an individual who uh, takes other gods besides Allah والعياذ بالله you know that, that individual has taken طاغوت we have individuals who for example take the materialistic life these philosophies that came out in the, in the uh, last few centuries about for example materialistic yeah. life if we see it then we believe in it and, and that is the God you know otherwise if we don't see it that's it mm. so these are the you know this is the extreme oppression 
And that's why لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين وشت من الغيف من يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقة. Allah says whomever rejects basically the belief in the طاغوت and believes in Allah سبحانه وتعالى as the ultimate, uh, you know, the ultimate deity, then then this individual has hold on, held on to the to the rope of guidance basically. Okay, thank you. Um, interesting, again, I mean, we have talked in a few uh, programs before about um, the, the Risalat al-Hukuq, the rights that uh, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam set out, um, and also the, the stipulations he set out with regard to animals and how um, even they recommended um, don't ride your horse until it gets too tired, you know, dismount, mm -hmm. Uh, walk with it, um, many uh, things to, to uh, prevent the animals from suffering. Yes. And it's quite interesting because now, of course, we have a lot of debates going on as to um, should we be bothering about the rights of animals when there's so much human suffering mm. uh, in the world? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's a balance of things, right? I mean, a few years ago, I remember there was a study that was done in, in, in the United States where they showed that uh, about $1.5 billion were spent on pets. $1.5 billion. Gosh. Um, there are about 300 million individuals in Africa alone living under poverty line. Yeah. I visited parts of Africa where people are literally making one dollar a day or two dollars a day. So within a month they make thirty dollars and those individuals cannot afford to send their children to school because they cannot afford the clothes. Although the education is free, the books and the clothes, they cost about ten dollars or so. They can't afford this ten dollars. So you can imagine if a person makes only thirty dollars. So if we have to have a balance here. We're not saying that also neglect the animals. No. We find our Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam, you know, L let me share this tradition with you from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. One day, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam came and he saw a slave who had two pieces of bread. He was eating one and he fed the other one to a dog. Mm -hmm. Imam al Hussein came to the slave and said, Is this your whole food? He said, yes, this is the entire portion. You know, not like today, for example, we have fridges full of food, yeah, mashallah. Yeah. You know, so it's, we can uh, afford to give <laughs> some yes. of the food. This person gave everything he had, basically. Half of it, he gave it to this dog, to this animal, and he took the other half in. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was touched by this. He came to this man and told him, why did you do this? He said, Ya ibna Rasulillah, I have a problem. There's something that is bothering me. And I live, we live in an area that we don't have many dogs here. So this dog probably traveled from a distance. And I, I see it there hungry looking at me. So I did not feel comfortable eating and not sharing yeah. and giving some food to this, this animal. And I thought maybe if I help this animal, Allah will help me. You know? So Imam al Hussein was really moved by this. He said, who do you work for? for? You know, who's, who's your owner? And he told him so and so. It was a Jewish man who owned a big, basically, um, garden. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam walked to that Jewish man. He knocked at his door. The Jewish man opened the door and he was shocked. He said, Imam al Hussein is at my door. What brings you here? You know, how great to yes. have you here. And he, subhanAllah, here just as a footnote, you know, here is a man who is not a Muslim, yet he values Imam yeah. Hussein alayhi salam to that extent. And no, we have today then, yeah. some, some Muslims, unfortunately, who don't give that value to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Nonetheless, so he said, your visit here is of such high value to me. What brings you here? He said, I am here to buy the garden of yours and to buy the slave. He said, Ya Abu Abdullah, your visit to me is worth much more than the garden and the slave. I gift it to you. Sorry. It's yours. Sorry. Take it. And he said, well, I will accept your gift and I will gift it to the slave and I will free the slave. Wow. I free the slave. So then the Jewish man, he said, and I say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah wa anna hujjatullah. You know, and I bear witness that you are the hujjah of Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. Because n only a person like you would do what, ha what one just did. Who would come? And Imam Hussein is not like a free person having a lot of free time on him. He's an Imam al masoor yes. This is during his Imamah. So he's got a lot of things on his hand, a lot of things on his plate. 
Yet, he makes time to help this individual who was helping an animal. You know, he takes time of his busy schedule, comes to this uh, Jewish man, and he discusses with him about buying the whole thing, uh, the, the whole garden, and then he gifts the garden to the slave. He frees. This man realized that only, uh, only a, a holy individual, an imam, a divine individual, would do something like this. So he became a Muslim and accepted. So here we, say, we see how Imam Hussein السلام, appreciated and respected this servant's action and compassion towards this animal. So we have that from our Imams alayhim salam in more than one occasion. Uh, we mentioned Imam al-Sajjad and here we have Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and, and many other occasions as well with Rasulullah and others. Uh, it's an amazing uh, story and I hope uh, our viewers have been uh, busy writing that down, uh, recommended to bring pen and paper when you watch this channel. Um, and what is interesting is uh, Again, we've got we've got different examples of the, um, the 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 release of oppression. So here is a person who had nothing, but he wanted to remove the oppression of um, the hunger of, of that of that animal. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. I mean, of course, the the greatest example of him rising up against oppression is is in Karbala. Yes. But here again, we we see how not only did he just offer to, let's say, purchase the slave in order to free him, but he's given him his, his you know, a, a means of livelihood um, as well. He's completely reversed um, his, his circumstances. Asante, you know, this is one thing that, uh, now that you've mentioned, it is important to touch upon, and that is Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam, always tried to build the society yeah. and the individuals within the society to make them independent mm -hmm. so they don't need to depend on anything one day a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he came with the intention of asking for money when he approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Prophet said whomever asks us we will give him but whomever doesn't ask us and becomes independent and ask Allah Allah will give him so this man kind of took the message, you know, he, he kind of thought maybe Rasulullah is talking to him, although the man did not say a word, yeah. did not mention anything yet. So he went back to his wife, his wife said, so did you ask him for money? He said, well, I went and this is what he said, so I got embarrassed to asking him, I'll go tomorrow. He goes the next day and the same thing happens, the Prophet says the same words. A third day and he says the same thing. So then this man says, you know what, that's it, he goes out. He goes to a person and borrows an axe. He takes the axe, goes to the woods, or in the, to the desert basically, they didn't have woods back then, uh, the desert, and he cuts some wood mm -hmm. with it. He brings it and sells it. And he earns enough, slowly he's, he earns enough until he can buy the axe. So he bought an axe, and slowly things started to go well. So one day he came to see Rasulullah, and Rasulullah repeated the same saying again. You know, after now things took off. So here we find Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, many times what he used to do is he used to buy slaves. And then what he used to do, he would buy, uh, he would go and develop land. You know, today we have people who are land developers. Yeah. Amir al-Mu'mineen used to be a land developer. He used to go to a piece of land. And in Islam, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the Islamic law states that if there is a land that's not claimed by anyone, then a person can go and claim it. Right. Yeah. So Amir al-Mun used to go to a land that was not owned by anyone. So he would claim this land, he would cultivate it, grow it, make it into a garden, then he would buy slaves, free them, and give them this garden. So then they would not be just freed slaves yeah, with nothing yeah. to do in the society. No, they have income, they don't need to be dependent. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, one day, one of his students, you know, he became a, a, you know, a barber. You know, one of the students from Imam mm -hmm. al-Sadiq alayhi salam was a barber. So Imam would teach them, educate them, give them a profession, and then free them, you know, and let them go into the society and the workforce, basically becoming independent. So here we have Imam al Hussein doing the same example, where not only did he want to free the slave, give him his life back, basically, but he wanted him to become an independent a member of society, one who can contribute to society. Yeah. 
So he gave him the whole garden so that he can also work. And remember, with that also comes, with the work also comes zakat, comes khums. So this individual now is going to contribute to the society. Yeah. So this is really, I hope people can sit down in this day and age of financial crisis, you know, and take a look at the examples of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam so that you know we can we can solve the problems happening in this day and age. Actually, it's, it's a good point to bring up because um, often, uh, I mean, for example, some people say um, they talk about again how dependent people are, let's say, on on uh, we could say benefits or welfare, etc. I remember years ago being asked by a woman. Um, was it necessary for her daughter to go to university uh, when they could claim welfare from the government and her daughter could stay at home? Uh, and it, it, we can see again that um, actually how we oppress ourselves in our, in our thinking through the way we think. So there is that kind of passivity, dependence upon being given whatever we, we can get, rather than the striving for, we could say, dignity that comes, you know, independence and dignity that comes. It all depends, like, you know, Islam, you know, this welfare system that you touch is actually an Islamic system. Yeah. And uh, there's this famous story of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam when he was the Khalifa of the Muslims, and when he saw the Christian man begging on the street, an old man, and he asked his companions, what is this? And this story is actually needs to be mentioned to the whole world because unfortunately not many people hear this about Islam because this is the true Islam. Yeah. He said, what is this? They said, ya, ya Amir al Mu'mineen, he is a Christian man. He said, I didn't ask who is he? I said, what is this? Why is there a man begging in my Khilafah, in my state, in my Islamic state? Amir al Mu'mineen used to actually take pride he said that in the whole state he governed, which extended from Iran all the way to Yemen, to mm -hmm. Egypt, you know, with the exception of Sham, that right. was not under his control. But otherwise, this whole state, he would take pride, there is not a single person starving, not a single person, you know, hungry. You know, the, the, the money he gets is divided equally and justly. Mm. And he used to look after, you know, his governors very carefully. And here, here we have a man, Amir al-Mu'mineen, whose Khilafah was only four years and eight months, during which he led three difficult wars. Yeah. Yet he pays attention to very little details, like his governor on Basra, Uthman ibn Hunayf, when he attended a meal, he was invited for a meal by the elites and for the elites only. Yeah which happens here in this day and age quite a lot. You have a certain authority member, a member of authority or an individual or certain status, where he only invites the, these group of individual. You know, This is not haram. But Amir al told Uthman ibn Hunayf, you being the governor should not attend such a place where the poor are deprived from attending. This is not right. Yeah. So he actually condemned him for doing this. He used to pay attention. And that's where he stated his famous saying where, your Imam is satisfied in his dunya with the, his two pieces of bread and her two garments of clothes, you know, and I know you cannot do that, you cannot handle that, so help me with your piety, with right. your taqwa. Yeah. So here he paid attention to all these things. So Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam used to take pride, you know, that people in his uh, uh, state, in his Islamic state, are not hungry, they're not poor. And here we have a Christian man who's begging, he says, why is he begging? Why is there a person begging? So he turns to his, today we call him the Minister of Finance, yeah. and he tells him, find him a house, you shelter him, and you assign him money from Bayt to Amwal al-Muslimin, from the house, Muslim uh, house of treasury. So you, you give him money. When he used to be young, you people dealt with him, had business with him, and you never complained about yeah. his religion or his faith. Now that he's old, you're claiming that he's a Christian man, or he's a Jewish man, or he's so and so. Islam views everybody equally when they're in the Islamic state. And so we do have that welfare system which applies not only to Muslims, yeah. it applies to anyone who lives under the Islamic state. This happened during the time of Rasulullah and Amir al alayhi salam. So we do have that system. However, it is not a system where, for example, a person, like you mentioned, would sit down and become dependent on the system 
when he is capable of becoming independent of the system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're just about to go to break. Uh, you're watching uh, Fatimiya special on Ahlul Bayt TV. Inshallah, we will see you again after a few minutes. I think it's, is it Maghrib yet? It is Maghrib. So we're going to take uh, 20 minutes uh, for Maghrib. We'll see you inshallah after Maghrib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to our Fatimiya special uh, during these uh, nights, Friday night. I'm Rebecca Masterton. My guest is Sheikh Osama Attar, who's coming from Canada directly to our studio. And uh, in light of uh, memory of the martyrdom of Hazrat Fatima, salam alayha, we are talking about uh, what is the correct conduct of living under tyranny. Uh, but this could be also tyranny upon ourselves or tyranny from our neighbors or someone from work as well as those ruling over us. So do feel free to call in uh, with any questions or comments. And um, may Allah also accept the uh, prayer of everyone who just prayed Maghrib as well. Um, and uh, we were just talking uh, before we went to break about uh, those who are um, oppressed through the way that they think. So they become, they allow themselves to be oppressed through a, a passive um, way of thinking or a way of thinking where perhaps they don't have enough um, faith in themselves or enough desire to be um, independent. And it's a very important point that you made uh, beforehand that the Ahlul Bayt, salam, when they helped people, um, their objective was to enable them to become independent. It wasn't just, you know, I mean, many of us, we might, give bits and pieces of charity and perhaps we um, we think, okay, we know it's not enough, but we, we do what we can. But um, there have also been arguments across the world as to whether a lot of the money that goes towards aid, we could say, um, is actually just encouraging um, particularly corrupt governments from just becoming more dependent mm. on on that aid, and that people have developed a kind of very passive, dependent kind of mindset upon upon just getting whatever they they can, rather than um, working towards becoming independent. Yes, no, you're, you're right. Uh, although recently, to comment on that, recently uh, a, a Nobel laureate, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who actually won the Nobel Prize for Peace a few years ago from Bangladesh, he's uh, written a book actually about the concept of social business. Right. You know, so that's now he's talking about it. He he was invited to Canada uh, not too long ago, where he spoke about it, and he's gone everywhere talking about this whole issue. In fact, he's he's established it already. Where the idea is that you not only give a loan to an individual. I mean, you don't, you don't just you don't give a loan. You give you you en enable the individual to work in a business that he or she will have some of the returns from that business to benefit as well so they become you know self you know dependent they don't make, uh, they don't need the help of others constantly and he says there are already millions of dollars if not billions of dollars dedicated to to aid yeah. and given to charities worldwide so he said we can take the same money and turn it around so just like what we mentioned this concept comes from an islamic concept that was applied by Ahlul Bayt where they did not just give a donation to their slaves, for example, they, they, they freed them yeah. and they would give them like here is, for example, some money and this will keep you happy for some time. But then what happens when the money runs out? Yeah. They would actually teach them a profession and then give them some money and tell them here, take this money now, use it to help your profession and establish your profession. And so they become an independent individual in the society, they become a contributing member to society. That does not mean we don't help those who are less fortunate or we should stop, you know, foreign yeah. aid and, 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 and helping the, the sadaqat or the charities. Uh, not at all. There are people who are in desperate need. Yeah. Many orphans, many widows who will have children that they need to raise. So there are cases where some individuals just are incapable of producing yes. working. So, yeah. so that doesn't mean we, we stop that as well. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a, that, that's a um, very uh, important point uh, to make, especially in this day and age. It seems that the number of orphans is just rapidly uh, increasing. Um, we've got a caller on the line now, so we're going to take this. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Walaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. What's your question? Hello. Hello. Uh, I just want to find out, uh, I the Sheikh has explained, how should someone behave living under the tyrant? Okay. Do you want to expand on your question? What, what did you have in mind exactly? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. So someone uh, rise up. Okay. Uh, or just remain silent and go about the daily life. Okay, okay. I didn't get the question. Uh, so it's, it's how, how should we live under um, a tyrant if we have, I mean, we've got many different types of tyrannical rule Correct, um, yes. around um, the world. And um, there are, um, obviously, it, it, it depends, I guess, on the circumstances, but there are people who are not sure, like, what should we do? Should we... Is it better just to, um, to, to wait and pray, or should we, should we stand up, should we shout, should we mm -hmm. campaign, uh, should we rise up, like we've seen what's going on with um, Tunisia and, and Egypt, now what's happening in, in Bahrain. Um, if so, what is the right way of, of doing that, or uh, not doing that, mm -hmm. etc. Here. If we take a look at the lives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the Imams alayhi wa salam, we see it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. For example, immediately after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam was quite vocal about her right, and she delivered that great sermon, Khutbat al in the mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, which was basically the platform for media at the time, yeah. uh, this was the pulpit, she used that, that platform to deliver her sermon explaining her rights and demanding her rights and explaining the oppression that was conducted against her, you know, by taking her right away from her. So here, whereas Amir al-Mu'mineen the circumstance at the time did not permit him to stand up yeah. and give a similar sermon. It does, not mean, it does not mean that he did not go and object to what was happening and ask for his right, but the political situation was such that he did not give a, a lecture or a speech like so the, way, the way Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam did. Hmm. And, and remember, at the time, at that particular time, Amir al-Mumin was the Imam. So not only was he the husband of Fatima al-Zahra, he was the Imam of Fatima al-Zahra yeah. alayhi salam. Yeah. So yet, the, 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 he, the, he agreed with what she did, but his task, his role was a little different, okay? And then if we come to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, again, the circumstances changed. So he was forced to go into this treaty. Yeah. And then with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, circumstances changed. And in his circumstances, he actually rose up in a battle and fought the battle of Karbala. And then after Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, we see the Imam's role changed a little bit, yeah. the direction changed. It was more of capitalizing on the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and spreading knowledge through not getting in combat, direct combat and yeah. fighting, but using the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam as, as basically the, the essence for their message. We have a hadith, for example, where a man came to Imam al-Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. And during the time of Imam al-Askari was a very difficult time. The name, his name al-Askari, because he was put in a, in a military compound, right. a city of Askar. Because what happened at that time is the Abbasi caliphs that came after al-Ma'mun, al-Abbasi, after him, they started bringing mercenaries, just like what we see happening in this day and age yes. as well. You know, the yeah. tactics are similar. They brought mercenaries, foreign mercenaries, because then they would not have compassion, you know, killing and, and basically uh, they're getting paid. So they don't have a problem killing these individuals, especially the, the Arabs yeah. in the city of Baghdad. Now, when the number of these uh, 
armed men increased, people complained to the Abbasid Caliph that why are you bringing so much, you know, you've turned Baghdad into a military compound. So he then moved, he shifted his, his, his uh, mercenaries and his military men into the city of Askar, which is in Samarra, you know, north of Iraq, north of uh, Baghdad. So, and that is where Imam al-Askari was kept. So he was kept in the city of Askar, in the, in the military compound. One day, he wanted to leave his, his house. He actually gave a message uh, earlier, telling his companions that when you see me walking in the street today, no one should point at me. Don't talk to your companion about me. Don't even make eye contact with me. The situation is very tense. Yeah. Okay. So, and then a man, for example, another time came to him and said to him, Ibn Rasulullah, I feel so bad that I see you in this state of oppression, yet I can't do anything to help you. And so Imam Al-Askari told him, this feeling of yours is sufficient. Just, you know, this is good enough and pray for us. So it really depends what we understand, you know, the summary from all these events that we just mentioned here is it really depends on the situation here. The situation must be assessed. Yeah. And then upon the assessment of the situation, which is usually done by our fuqaha in this day and age, then a reaction is, is uh, executed by, okay. as, as, as uh, this, uh, advised by the fuqaha. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I, I think that's important to clarify because we can see um, many different circumstances we, when we look at the, the lives um, of the Imams alayhim salam. What, what has um, often struck me is um, how, for example, um, I mean, we've got many examples, but just go straight to uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam because there's a section on, um, on um, serving kings or living under kings mm -hmm. in um, At Tabarsi's uh, collection, Mishkat al Anwar. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he gives quite uh, a few interesting. <coughs> um, directives um, where, uh, for example, he says, um, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam has said, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has servants in the courts of oppressive kings who can help fend off oppression from God's friends. Um, they are saved from the fire by God. So um, his advice has been that, uh, as it says here, uh, the kafara, interesting he uses that, that mm -hmm. word because we usually associate that with um, if you miss a, a fast. A fast you know. or something, correct. Um, uh, for working for a king is to fulfill the needs of believing brothers. So I, I think this is a very important um, it, piece of advice where when, it, when the uh, circumstances don't allow for the removal of, of that tyrant, um, there are ways of, of living under such mm -hmm. a rule, which is that you um, you must have your intention and your effort going to uh, assisting the the mu'minin and and you know your brothers and sisters uh, yeah. in faith as well. I, I will mention two examples regarding this. You know, one where Ahlul Bayt told someone to get out of the government, and one where they told him to stay in government. Right. The first one is with Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu There was a companion of Imam al-Sadiq by the name of Ali ibn Abi Hamza. Ali ibn Abi Hamza, every year he used to come to Medina from Kufa and visit Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. A friend of his who used to work for Bani Umayyah told him that I see you every year leaving at the same time. Where do you go? He said to him, I go to visit Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He says, next time you go, I want to come with you. Right. He said, okay. He, the next year, they went together. When they entered before the Imam, Imam alayhi salam always had a habit. Whenever a new person would come, they would ask him, how are things? Who are you? Where do you come from? Uh, so that, you know, they, they give him some attention. Yeah. And, and we see this in some of our fuqaha in this day and age as well. When they see someone coming in, they also ask him similar questions. So Imam started asking him questions, and then this man said to the Imam, he said, Yabna Rasulullah, I work for the government of Bani Umayyah. Is my work allowed there? Now in this case, Imam al-Sadiq assessed this man and the situation of this man and his circumstance. He told him it is because of people like you 
that Bani Umayyah have deprived us of our rights. Right. Remember, you know, this is an interesting note here because a tyrant cannot really do things by himself. He's got True. helpers, assistants. Yeah. And it is the problem of these assistants, unfortunately. You know, what we see sometimes, the oppression that is happening in the world, it is not the leader himself taking out this oppression on the people. He's ordering it, and there, there are people who are conducting yeah. it. And this is the sad part, you know, for whatever reason, money or hate or uh, whatever. So here we have Imam Sadiq pointing to this point, that your work for Bani Umayyah is basically aiding them to deprive us of our right, our haqq. He told him, but if I tell you what to do, will you do it? He said, yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. He said, listen, you have to quit your job and every penny that you earned, or pence you guys say, yeah. everything that you earned from that income, you have to do donate it all. If you do this, I will guarantee you Jannah. Right. Ali ibn Abi Hamza says, we went back to Kufa. The minute we arrived in Kufa, my friend went to the member in Masjid al-Kufa, to the pulpit, and he started calling, is there any poor person in Kufa? Is there any needy in Kufa? Any orphans in Kufa? So people started gathering around him, and he distributed everything he had. Uh -huh. he, Ali ibn Abi Hamza said he even took off his shirt. He said, even this is also, I'm going to donate it. So he said, I ran home and brought him something to wear. And it was a couple months later, he became ill, and he died. This man died. Oh. The next year, Ali ibn Abi Hamza went to visit Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And the minute he entered, Imam al-Sadiq told him, Ya ibn Abi Hamza, we fulfilled our promise to your companion. Alhamdulillah. Promise has been fulfilled. Okay. So, this was also another example of true tawbah, the true definition of tawbah. Yeah. This was a true tawbah. This is something that's not easy to do. Working for the government means you have an authority. I mean, even in this day and age, working for the government is a stable job. You know, yes. you get a lot of benefits yeah. from doing so. So imagine somebody who quits this job and gives up everything, his whole life. You know, he had a lot of money because he used to work for the government. And he gave it all up, you know, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the pleasure of Allah, and he got Jannah instead. This, this is a true bargain. You know, this is the good bargain. So this is one example here, where the Imam assessed the situation. Maybe the Imam realized this man will be dying soon. Yeah. Um, so, and he saw that he would not be able to help people much more. Uh, or it could be another reason, you know, there could be many reasons here as to why the Imam السلام, told this man to quit his job and leave the government. That's one example. The second example is from Imam Al-Kadhim and the famous minister Ali ibn Yaqtin who used to be the minister of Harun, you know, in the Harun's yeah. cabinet, you know, in Harun's uh, government. And Ali ibn Yaqtin was one of the sincere followers of the Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Kadhim. And Imam al-Kadhim instructed him to stay in that post as long as he serves the mu'mineen and the needs of the mu'mineen. Right. And one day, Imam al uh, Ali ibn Yaqtin, because he was a big minister, again, he used to earn a lot of money, he also, it was diff he used to carry the money to Imam al-Kadhim, khums, zakat, huquq, and so on and so forth, some money. And he used to travel in the middle of the night, because remember, his post is very well known, he's a very well known man. Yeah. So, so he used to travel at night from, from Baghdad to, to come to Medina to give the money to the Imam. So one night, you know, in all secrecy and privacy, he managed to leave Baghdad, he gets to Medina, he knocks at the door of Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al says, I'm not gonna open the door for you. You know, it's a long story, but the bottom line is, he tells him why, he says, you know, you know my situation, I cannot stay with this money in my head for too long. So Imam al-Sadiq tells him, the other day, Ibrahim al-Jammal, who is a poor man, came at your door, he knocked at your door, and you did not open the door for him. And this is not the akhlaq of uh, our no, followers. No. You broke his heart, so you're not welcome to my house. I don't care about your money, you know. So then the man started crying. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, help me. Okay, I, I will. He said, will you do what I tell you? He said, yes. He said, you have to go and ask forgiveness from Ibrahim al-Jamal. He said, but he is all the way in Kufa and I'm here. So Imam, through a miracle, managed to get Ali ibn Yaqtin to Kufa instantaneously. He went to Ibrahim al-Jamal. He knocked at his door. Ibrahim opened the door and he saw Ali ibn Yaqtin, the minister is at his house. He said, come on in. He said, I will come in with one condition that you do what I tell you to do. He said, okay. He came in, Ali ibn Yaqtin put his face on the sand, and he told Ibrahim to step on his face, wow. you know. 
He said, you're the minister, why do you want me to do this? He said, I want you to do this so that you forgive me, for discipline me. Mm. And he did so, nonetheless, then he came back and Imam opened the door for Ali ibn Yaqteen and welcomed, uh, welcomed him in. So here we have the Imams, alayhim salam in one case, telling one man that he should quit his job and not aid this tyrannic uh, government. And in another case, Imam tells him, no, you stay in that position yeah. as long as you serve the Mu'mineen. If you fall short of your uh, doing your duty, we don't want to see you anymore. You know, so it's a great discipline yeah. for the Imams. And there's another cases, of course, another examples where also followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Take, took some positions and posts, but they served mu'mineen with these posts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, uh, uh, just just as a side point, um, it, it, this also emphasizes uh, the importance of um, making tawbah as soon as possible. Absolutely. Um, where, yeah. yes. you know, again, we might think later, 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 uh, and yes. we don't know that uh, it could be next week, next month, our time mm -hmm. is up. Correct, yes. Um, this concept of, um, in, in a hadith and in a dua, they call it tasweef, at tasweef. Tasweef means you're delaying tawbah. Right. And if you read the munajat at taibin of Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, he, he mentions this concept of tasweef. That my nafs, myself, tells me to delay and delay and delay. Yeah. You know, so I keep on delaying. You know, but how long can I delay for? You know, so he says, now I'm back. Now I'm at your gates again. So now you accept my tawbah. And of course, a mu'min, that's why in this ayah that I recited earlier about dhulm nafs Allah says, a mu'min, a true muttaqi, an individual who has piety, are those who, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ And those, when they commit a sin, basically, they immediately remember Allah. And they do istighfar, you know, for their sins. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the concept of seeking tawbah immediately is important, very important. Um, it reminds me of something I read the other day um, where Imam Ali alayhi salam says, um, that which you run away from, you will soon arrive at. <laughs> So, uh, i.e. death, you know, or, or it could be applied to many other things that we're trying to r run away from the reality of our situation, but as we're running away, we're, we're going to arrive Absolutely. at it. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, as he says, you know, the second a person is, is born, every breath he takes is one step closer to his death, yeah. basically, to his grave. Um, so, well, uh, alhamdulillah, there's, I mean, it, it's again very important to recognize uh, the, the different circumstances under which um, the Imams salam, gave um, different instructions, because again, what that implies is that, of course, it's, uh, it's important to use intelligence when, when um, deciding what, what is the best course of action. We can see with Hazrat Fatima, salam alayha, um, in fact, she would have known that her time was coming soon because Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, had, had told her mm -hmm. that. Um, and so she, I mean, probably wasn't for that reason, but she knew that uh, given the circumstances, she, she, she was able to, to speak out. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, lived much longer. And of mm -hmm. course, as you say, his role was different. He had to kind of... Um, contain um, any potential fracturing um, in, in the Ummah. Um, exactly. I mean, he, he was already fighting a number of wars. Uh, he didn't want it to, to get any worse. Asante, I mean, it's not just a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of hukum, what, what to do in that particular circumstance. Yeah. And that's why I say in this day and age, it's not just a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of what the fuqaha, yeah. how they assess the situation. Um, for example, when, when, when the shrines of Imam al-Askariyyayn alayhi salam were blown, yeah. uh, that's an act of oppression and aggression. Yeah. Yet we have our fuqaha, for example, issuing statements immediately that no mosques should be attacked yeah. you know, be, uh, as a consequence. And, and that really prevented civil war from happening. So, so the fuqaha, they assess the situations and they give a ruling accordingly. Mm. Now, going back to the issue of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, it is not just a matter of her living a short time after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. No, the opportunity that she had, being a female, and versus Amir al-Mu'mineen, they would have killed him. Yeah. You know, and in fact, they tried to kill him. Yeah. 
unless she, uh, you know, and when, when she stepped in and she basically said, I'm not going to, you know, when they came and took Amir al-Mu'mineen out and the whole concept was he either pays the allegiance or he gets killed. And um, she then immediately intervened. And they, they, although they, they even didn't leave her alone, but nonetheless, her intervention saved Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi. And so, but Imam's role was a little bit different as he explains in the third sermon of Nahj al -Balagha. He said, you know, فَصَبَرْتُ وَفِي الْعَيْنِ قَدَى وَفِي الْحَلْقِ شَجَى You know, when he, when he talks about the, the, his right being taken away from yeah. him in the khutbah al-shakshaqiyya. And he says that I was, I was left with two options. I either rise all alone, there's no supporter, yeah. or I sit down and have the patience. You know, so I, 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 I chose to become patient but it is, was not an easy patience. It was the patience as if someone has a, a bone stuck in his throat yeah, yeah. or, or some, uh, something bothering him in his eyes. And, and then he explains what happened then after the first and the second and how the third happened and so on and so forth. So, but until he had the supporters, and he says, he says, once I had the supporters, then I had the obligation to rise. And so he rose. Right. Asking for, I mean, for his right, and he became the Khalifa, and then he started fighting these Wars. So it is not just a matter of living longer or shorter life after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is, as I mentioned, the Imam alayhi salam, uh, the Imams and the Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, they assessed the situation and they saw that at that particular time, Fatima al Zahra had this opportunity to speak. Amir al Mu'minin didn't. Mm -hmm. We find a similar situation happening with Zainab and Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam. You know, Zainab yes. alayhi salam had the opportunity to give a lecture in Kufa. Imam Sajjad didn't. In fact, he was about to be killed. Again, a similar situation. He was about to be killed just for speaking. He didn't even give a lecture. Yeah, but Zainab intervened, alayhi salam, and she managed to save him. However, in Sham, he had the opportunity to, to, to speak. So then he gave a lecture. He gave, he gave a speech in Sham. So it all depends on the situation. The Imams alayhi salam assessed the situations and they act upon it. But this takes us to the point that we find Zainab salam Allahi alayha and yeah. Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam. Of course, Zainab being the student of Fatima al-Zahra yeah. alayha salam and Amir al-Mu'mineen and Imam al-Hasan al Hussein and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So we find her doing the exact same thing her mother did. You know, when she had the opportunity to speak, she spoke out against oppression. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that is unique here. Saying that women do get involved sometimes and they're not forbidden from being involved. Imam al Sajjad was not only the, the, the nephew of Zainab, but he was also the Imam of Zainab yeah. yeah. after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. He did not stop her and tell her, Ya Amma, don't say this or you, know, you should not be doing this. No. Which means he agreed with what she did. Amir al Muni did not stop Fatima al Zahra from doing what she did, which means he agreed with what she did. So we find that, you know, at certain circumstances, even women should also take up the leads. Yeah. And that's what we find. That's why in one of my lectures, I mentioned that we find today the daughters of Zainab alayhi salam and the daughters of, uh, I mean by spiritual daughters, yeah. of Zainab and Fatima Zara, they're also leading uprises and asking for their rights as well. But unfortunately, the same way that Zainab and Fatima Zara were faced with oppression, these also daughters of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam are also faced with oppression. Yeah. It's, um, in a way, I mean, what happened with Ahlul Bayt, uh, alayhim salam, is kind of, it's, it's kind of an example or a pattern or archetype of, of what has happened uh, ever since uh, in history. We've just got three minutes. I wanted to ask a quick point um, to clarify, because again, some people, with regard to Fa uh, Hazrat Fatima salam, alayhi uh, speaking out um, and protecting Imam Ali, alayhi salam, I mean, often people will say, Come on, you know, he, this was Imam Ali. Why did he depend on, on Fatima salam alayha, to, yeah. to defend him? Why would he have allowed her to be, for example, close to, to the door and yeah. someone to approach the yes. door? What, what would your answer be? Here, to be very brief here, uh, there are several points. First of all, from the cultural point of view, the Arabs would not attack a woman. Yeah. It was actually a shame for a knight to attack a woman or beat a woman. It was a shame. Yeah. Regardless, regardless of what they thought of women, and the, the, the lack of respect they had for him. But it, to go against a woman was not something that is good. It was a shame, embarrassing. Right, right. So, and we find this, what happened on the eve when they wanted to go and kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you know, at night. Yeah. What made them stop from going in the night to kill Rasulullah? They waited until dawn, if you read the story carefully. Why? Because actually, they said that there are women in the house of the Prophet 
and we don't want to walk, you know, and, and harass these women, yes. you know, or, or stu stumble upon them because it's dark, we can't see our way, so we might, you know, uh, yeah. uh, trip over a woman. And, and that's, that would be embarrassing. We're going to kill Rasulullah, you know, they didn't call him Rasulullah, but they went, we're going to kill the Prophet, yeah. and when we stumble upon So culturally, that was not acceptable. So even the kuffar of Quraysh did not attack the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, even though he was their enemy, and they wanted to kill him, they waited until dawn because there were women in the house. So culturally speaking, by Imam Amir Wani presenting Fatima, he's actually, you know, culturally they would not attack. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's one thing. And the second thing is because, again, the whole plan was that they come after Amir al Mumini Ali ibn Abi Talib. The plan was to get him to do the bay'ah. So if Fatima stands there, then it, it will be more of a, a barrier mm -hmm. for them, a shield, for them to attack Fatima and go after Amir al Mumini. It's not that he was weak, but of course Amir al Mumini played it. Um, right, religiously and culturally. Okay, thank you very much, and inshallah we can continue that after the break. You're watching Ahlul Bayt live, and we're going to take uh, a short break again. Inshallah, we'll see you again after a few minutes. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome back to Ahlul Bayt live, our Fatimiya special on Ahlul Bayt TV. I'm Rebecca Masterton, and my guest is Sheikh Osama Al Attar, who has just flown in from Canada straight to the studio uh, and we are talking about how we should conduct ourselves under oppressive circumstances and that could be any kind of oppressive circumstances so do feel free to call in with any questions or comments or any cases that you might think of that you need a resolution to uh, do feel free to call in and um, we were just uh, talking uh, about this example of um, why Imam Ali alayhi salam allowed Hazrat Fatima salam alayha to stand by by the door, uh, and you were saying again that culturally um, it was uh, a shame upon um, someone from Arab culture to to attack uh, a woman or kill a woman, um, and. Um, and this was even held, this, this belief was even held by the, the non-Muslim Quraysh. I wanted to raise the, that um, interesting point that, um, and we've got a caller, but we'll just, I'll just finish my point, that these, it seems that these non-believing Quraysh had more honor than a lot of, you know, people who would call themselves Muslim nowadays who are quite happy to well, attack women. You know, it's interesting because even at the time of, in the Battle of Karbala with Imam Hussein, you know, when Imam Hussain was lying in the plains of Karbala before his death, Shimr ibn al Jawshan, he had started attacking the tents of Imam Hussain. Yeah. Then Imam Hussain gathered some strength and he showed, shouted. He said, Ya Shi'ata ala Abi Sufyan, O followers of Abu Sufyan, if you are not Muslims and there is no religion between us and you anymore, at least kunu a'araban kama taz'umun. Be Arabs as you claim. Right. And so Shimr said, what is the man saying? What is he saying? What does he want to say? So he said, if I'm alive, then he replied again. He said, if I'm alive, how can you attack my women in my life, in my presence? Yes. So then Umar ibn Sa'd, you know, being Umar ibn Sa'd, you know, he turned to Shema and he said, leave his tents and go get the man himself. Right. So leave his woman. Yeah. So even then, you see, they, they did not attack the woman in the presence of Imam Hussein. After they killed Imam Hussein, then they raided the tents. So this was a cultural thing, the Arabs, they had this cultural thing, and that's what Imam Hussein called them for. Religion is not gonna stop yeah, you guys, yeah. so go back to your culture if you claim to be that you're Arabs. But they were in danger even of violating that. Looked at that moment, they were just- Yes, using, yeah, exactly. Using it to kind of so you see that, that those individuals who are so-called Muslims, you know, they, they did not have anything that was Arabic cultural and was because it was even in pre-Islamic Arabia, it was forbidden to fight in the month of Muharram. Yeah. You know, so they went against the culture, they went against the religion, they went against every principle that yeah. was held. And the same thing happened, you know, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and it continues until this day and age. Thank you very much and uh, we will take the call. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Thank you for accepting my call. Uh, I, I try to study history, but I think that maybe you are, you are ignoring things because it doesn't serve uh, the argument that you are making. For example, the first, uh, first martyr of Islam is Sumeya. Yeah. Now, the Arabs had no issues in murdering her in the most, you know, in the most brutal manner. Uh, and secondly, even when the so-called, you know, if the incident is correct about Bibi Fatima being murdered, mm. then the issue is that she did call out. It, this is what the narration is that when she's standing behind the door, she, she is calling out not to attack the door. 
So obviously, if the culture was that they wouldn't attack a woman, then they would have gone away. Yeah. And the third issue is that even when the third Khalifa, Osman, is murdered, the, his wife's hand is chopped off before he's murdered. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can quote so many incidences to show that this so-called chivalry amongst the pagan mm. Arabs or just didn't exist. I think what we are doing is being very selective in order to justify <laughs> it's, something. It's, it's not... It's now, let not, me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> Uh, so, I know it's emotional for you, but it's, emotional it's for not me emotional well. at all. I think you're the one who's being emotional, but please carry on. But because I'm trying to say something and you're trying to interrupt me. Uh, please it's go ahead. Show. I agree, it's your show and you will have the last word. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying to you is that surely the truth is the issue. And I don't think Bibi Fatima or Imam Ali benefits by trying to, you know, have stories like this, which actually don't hold any historical grounds. So, one point that I want to make to you and your guest is this. Then let us say that what you are saying is correct. Then ultimately, when Bibi Fatima passes away, then nobody was protecting Mullah Ali anyway. So then whom did you hide behind? Surely, so you need to analyze this story again, isn't it? Okay, thank you very much. Um, did you finish or you have more to say? Oh, he's, he's finished. Okay, uh, first of all, um, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding mm-hmm. on the part of the caller. Um, We're not trying to justify the so-called chivalry of the Arabs um, by giving a few examples in order to justify a certain position. That's a rather unfortunate misunderstanding that has gone on the part of the caller. Um, And to be emotional, I don't think we're very emotional at the moment, are we? No, we're not particularly emotional. Um, But uh, certainly um, we've cited some examples where... um, certain honor was uh, the women was respected but in fact if you had been listening just a couple of seconds ago you would have heard uh, our respected sheikh say how those who for example were going to murder imam hussein alayhi salam were on the verge of violating even their culture they were about to attack um, the the female members of imam hussein mm-hmm. alayhi salam's family and of course these examples as well exactly that in fact i would back up the points that the caller has made um, that uh, there are times when uh, particularly in, in fighting against the Muslim women um, that this, this chivalry wasn't respected and we can certainly see with regard to Hazrat Fatima salam alayha, exactly if the people who approached the door had honoured their culture they would have left but these people who approached the door didn't honour even their culture, and they were quite happy to attack a woman. Correct, yeah. I mean, what the caller has said, there are certain examples about, like, you know, Sumayya and mm. things, but this was because, I mean, of Sumayya's religion change and things. If you take a look at the Arabic culture in general, the Arabic culture in general does not permit this. Yeah. The Arabic culture in general, there is a chivalry that, w- that was there. Uh, where a person would not attack a woman. This was a standard thing in the Arabic culture. Right. So this was there. Now, I, I agree with the caller when he said there are certain examples here, and that, in fact, that as- asserts what we were saying yeah. earlier. I think where people who attacked Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and Amir al-Mu'mineen, people who attacked Imam Hussein alayhi salam, these people were not acting on religion grounds, yeah. nor cultural grounds, yeah. because their intention was just pure greed, and hence that was their motivation. I think this is the whole point as well, that they they um, they went against, uh, and this is the definition of a tarot, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That um, the tarot is one who, um, ex- as it says here, exceeds his legitimate limits. Mm-hmm. So they, they went beyond all limits, they went beyond all limits of humanity. So yeah, basically excessive tuhiyan, yeah. or basically oppression, uh, excessive is called tarot. Yeah. And that's where an individual basically goes beyond, you know, in any matter, bec- becomes uh, extremely oppressive. Mm. And this, of course, doesn't uh, apply in leadership issues. It could also apply in the house. You know, sometimes you have the, the husband, for example, becoming a ta'ahut yes. on the family. Yeah. Uh, or the, the mother, for example, becoming a ta'ahut on the children, yeah. for example, uh, oppressive. So, or, or a company leader becoming, you know, parvod on his employees. Yeah, this happens a lot. So, so we have that sort of societal, uh, societal um, implications of tyranny and oppression as well that we didn't get much time to touch upon, but uh, they are also there. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I do apologize if we appear to be terribly emotional. Um, 
and just one of the um, the other points um, which I think we could um, uh, again touch upon, uh, looking at what is going on in the world today. Um, <clears throat> for example, with regard to again what's happening with with women in the Muslim world, like with with Tunisia. Uh, the the fact that there are many countries around the world who are uh, you know oppressing Islam or oppressing Muslims in different ways, for example, preventing women from from wearing the scarf, and we could see this um, in Tunisia. I mean, what is interesting is that um, um, I mean now hijab is starting to be permitted in Tunisia, but what what is interesting is that this has come from the people themselves in that. <coughs> In order to um, change the circumstances, um, the conditions under which they live, for example, with women in Tunisia, I know that um, it was virtually impossible to, to wear hijab if you wanted a job or if you wanted to work in the government. Um, but there started a movement in that country for the for the wearing of hijab, and now it seems finally it's it's become acceptable or, mm -hmm. or permissible. Yes, so it's it's unfortunate that. Some people think that religion is backward. Yeah. Religion is, is not something that is modern. And, and that's why you talk about, uh, there are even, uh, you, you hear about seminars and conferences, modernization of Islam or Islam and modernism. You know, one thing we want to clarify, Islam is a modern religion from day one. You know, you don't need to modern. Yeah. The Prophet said, whatever is halal is halal. Until the day of judgment, whatever is haram is forbidden. Is forbidden until the day of judgment. This is this is the religion. This is how it is, and it's a dynamic religion. It's a, we don't need to modernize Islam. Islam is a modern religion. Yeah. It's, it's a modern. Uh, it's modern in every era, every time, including the Quran. You know, the, a, a man came to Imam Al Sadiq and told him, you know, there's something really uh, wonderful about this Quran that every time it, it appears as if it's speaking to the people of this time. And he says, this is one of the miracles of the Holy Quran. And this applies until this day and age, you know. So that's one thing. And unfortunately, some so-called Islamic governments have also, you know, adapted these uh, ideologies mm. where they're saying that, oh, religion is backward, so we need to, to, to live in a modern world. And hence, hijab is also oppressive. Hijab puts them back. Yani, this is really strange. I mean, I don't understand why would a hijab, a woman covering her hijab, I mean, how does that s stop her from producing in the society? I yeah. mean, it, it doesn't cover her, her mind, you know, uh, yeah. the hijab. So, uh, same thing with men, even, you know, in, in this day and age, you see them sometimes also wearing these tight clothing and whatever. Like, is this the way that the, without this, they cannot think? They can become intellectuals? You know, yeah. this, is, this is what allows them to become intellectuals? So, it's really, you know, strange how people have taken this perception about religion when in fact if you take a look at these laws that were in, in, introduced by Islam it is there for the convenience of society it is there for the enhancement of society enhancement of productiv mm. uh, productivity in, within society and you brought up a very interesting point is that women for them, themselves with the, with the case of hijab they are the ones who are asking for their rights to wear hijab which is really great because sometimes when men we speak on behalf of women. People tell us that, oh, you're men, you don't wear the hijab, so you don't really know what's yeah. it like to, to, to wear the hijab and you go outside there. But when you have women themselves demanding their rights in Tunisia, in, in Turkey, in other parts of the Muslim world, to be given the freedom to express themselves the way they want to express themselves, not how the government wants yeah. them to express themselves. So we just pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know, there will be justice to be served in the world where people are allowed to practice their religion freely mm. without fear of persecution or loss of employment or so on and so forth. Um, what it also seems is that, I mean, well, first of all, talking of timing uh, with regard to, for example, what happened uh, in, in Egypt, some of people might say, why now, why not earlier? And again, a lot of it is to do with circumstances, as we mm -hmm. say. Um, uh, but also, um, what what we can see people across the world living under different forms of oppression or tyranny. It shows that there are uh, different methods, as we can see through the Imams of Ahl Bayt salam, as well, that, for example, just with the wearing of, of hijab, it's not, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways of, of 
uh, resisting tyranny in a, in a peaceful way. Um, we can see even with Hazrat Fatima salam alayha, through words, through, through speaking um, as well, or um, in campaigning for hijab simply by, by wearing the hijab. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, one thing I, I kind of wanted to, to look at as well is the, the fact that if you are a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, it's very important to, uh, to keep your, your dignity in the way that you do try to campaign against oppression because again we are meant to reflect or we're meant to be kind of a source of pride for for the imams as well mm -hmm. so we're not meant to kind of um, engage in behavior that is kind of degrading or um, you know mindless we could say absolutely I mean if you take a look at Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam again you know if you take a look at the description through which she left her house, the state she left her house, to go give that sermon in yeah. the Prophet's Masjid. I mean, uh, her, her, her dress was long that she was, you know, stepping on it. That's how long it is. So we're not telling women today to wear these long dresses, yeah. you know, and get them dirty. But nonetheless, you can say, and then, and then she lathat khimaraha, she put on her hijab, the, the cover, the head cover, and she went out with a group of her women. You know, um, some of the women and her maids, yeah. they went out together, you know. And then she asked for a curtain to be uh, installed. And then she spoke behind the curtain. But that did not prevent her, you know. So all this hijab and whatever did not stop her from practicing her role in society the way it, it is needed. Yeah. Even if we go a step back, in fact, in the Battle of Uhud, when people left Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, alone and a woman by the name of Nasiba, Nasiba al-Ansariya she picked up a sword and she started fighting defending Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi she saw that the men are gone you know all except a handful of, of men who stayed with Rasulullah so she came and she started defending and the Prophet did not tell her Nasiba no 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 go back you should not there is no for example war on you or oh, this is gonna af affect your dignity yeah. and as a no she, she had her hijab she wore I think, and she defended Rasulullah, and she injured so many wounds that you know it took a year for her to actually recover. And we find Safiya, the aunt of the Prophet, Safiya, in the Battle of Al Ahzab, Al Khandaq. She saw a spy from the enemies coming and spying on the camp of Rasulullah mm -hmm. sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi. So she told the poet of Rasulullah, Hassan ibn Thabit. She told him, Hassan, there is a spy out there. And you better go stop him, otherwise he'll go and tell the enemies where are the holes of the Muslim's army. Hassan was not a man of war. He said, you know, I'm not a man of war. So he backed out. Backed out. So she actually took a pillar of a tent, the aunt of Rasulullah, Safiya. Yeah. And she went behind the spy and she killed the spy. You know? So, so here we have examples of women taking part in, in, in the society at different uh, you know, levels yeah. of society. And yet, they're still maintaining their integrity, they're still maintaining their hijab, and Ahlul Bayt did not stop them from doing so. So here, we don't find that as an obstacle, you know, for a person to perform his duties. And same thing applies for men as well, you know. Maintaining their religion is not an obstacle in them getting enhanced and moving forward in yeah. society. Thank you. Um, uh, and I think uh, this is, this is uh, obviously going, going to be an, an ongoing thing until until the the rising of our party. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, the 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 kind of um, um, gentle pressure applied um, in order to, as you say, just be able to practice your your religion um, without uh, being prevented from 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 working, uh, without being attacked. I mean, again, um, talking of honour. Um, I saw a photo uh, recently because of the, the niqab issue of, uh, of a woman in niqab being dragged by a whole group of male policemen, um, either in France or, or in the States. Uh, and, and again, it's, it, it's just quite astonishing that, uh, again, in this case, you know, there's no, there's no sense of, of honour, there's no sense of um, the value of, of, of this woman as well. Just. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, um, there is freedom of expression, as they say, but they try to put some limits on that freedom of expression. Yeah. You know, so 
is it freedom of expression for a person to walk, for example, um, you know, almost without clothes on in the street, but that's considered a freedom of expression. But when a woman wants to willingly herself, you know, cover herself, that's not considered to be a freedom of expression anymore, you know. So, I mean, they come up with some um, justification. They say, well, okay, during exam, for example, if they write an exam, we need to see who is writing the yeah. exam. So I say, okay, no problem. I mean, find, get a lady, and she can do the inspection, she can check. You know, or when they want to ride a plane, get the lady, and she can do the check. Yeah. You know, there's no problem. So, there's, so the justification is, is, is not really valid, you know. And unfortunately, you know, what's, what's worrisome is that it, today is starting with niqab, the face cover. Tomorrow it will go with hijab. Yeah. Yeah. It already has started in France. Um, there, there's been a school where girls who wear long skirts now, it's not even, it's not jilbab, it's not abaya, it's not hijab, it's not niqab, it's just long skirt. There, there's been objections to them wearing long skirts as well. So, 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 so I mean, where will you end? In fact, I, I saw an interview with a director of a Christian school in the States. I can't remember what state, but it's Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a, a dress code. You know, so women have to wear long skirts, uh, long sleeve shirts, and so on and so forth. And I remember that the, the, the interviewer, she was a lady, she was telling this director, was a man, it's like, are, aren't you applying the same rules as the Taliban? She said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, he said, these are our rules. People want to come to our, to our schools. He says, we find it that, you know, this reduces the problems in our schools, Yeah. you know? So, I mean, so it's interesting that it's not only Muslims here yes. who are applying these rules. Yeah. I mean, even non-Muslims, people of the monotheistic religion, they agree on these issues. And they don't have a problem with it because they, they, they realize the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. So, it's very unfortunate to see that, you know, even in, in, in non-Muslim schools, people wearing long skirts, yeah. past wearing long skirts, are still being attacked. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's become a, a, a stigma. Um, well, we've got a, a caller a, again on the line, so uh, we'll just uh, take this call now. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. My name is Ali, by the way, and I'm really from Newcastle in, New in England. Welcome. Uh, regarding the last caller, which was, I think, in my opinion, he was quite rude, and he called you things that it was from his own part, the fault that he had. But what I'm saying, Unfortunately, some of these people who have got the customs from the old, uh, inherited from the old people of, you know, their nations in the past. Right. Some, some of these, like, for example, um, the regimes like in Bahrain or even Saudi Arabia, no, they live in luxury and in so much, you name it, that most of the other people are living in poverty and they don't have any jobs and anything. They don't think of that. I can't understand these people. Why can't they think of others as well, not only just being selfish, just mm. thinking about themselves and not considering other people as well? Everybody has right. If you are a true Muslim, you got to think about everyone else, not only just yourself. Yeah. you got to look at this thing. For example, uh, Sister Rebecca, you yourself, you came to Islam, you followed the <clears throat> Islamic way, you studied, you continued, you came to the truth, you finally, when I'm looking at two, both of your faces, it's some sort of light coming, just like Ahlul Bayt had. I think that is some special light, like Imam Hassan Salam Allah he had this light when he was sitting I, in I the night. I think it's the studio lighting, actually. <laughs> uh -huh. Well... It is something I think is inherited. It's the faith that it's the I think that the belief itself and following these Ahlul Bayt is got special light in that bringing on your faith. And I hope looking at the other people, they call so called light like for example some Sunni leaders, not all of them, there are plenty of good people among them as well. But they just let themselves go with beard all over the place, even they don't clean themselves. How good example they can be for the rest of the society. Mm -hmm. And they disregard all the facts, all the truths about what the children of the prophet, and these were the people, some of these leaders that now we see, what they do in Bahrain, for example, mm -hmm. or in Yemen, 
they were the one who killed the children of the prophet. They were the one who killed the daughter of the prophet. What is going on? Why can't the people just, you know, understand, just think properly and believe in Quran? And you. also, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, that it was truly what he told them to obey and do what they are told and to believe in Allah truly and honestly. Thank you very much. That's all I can say. Thank you, Brother Ali, uh, for, for, for calling in. Um, and, um, uh, uh, well, thank you for your kind remarks. I, th I, th I think it is, as I said, the lighting in the studio due to our um, skillful technicians. Mm. Uh, and may Allah bless our technicians. Um, but uh, I, I think this is a good point as well, that, that so, rights, yeah. as Muslims, we should be considering everybody's, uh, everybody's rights and anybody who is mm -hmm. under a form of oppression. You know, Imam Ali summarized in one sentence, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا رَأْسُ كُلِّ خَطِيئًا you know, the love of dunya, this and the love of the materialistic life in dunya is the, the essence of every sin, yeah. is the drive behind every sin. And that's why Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam in dua Abu Hamza al-Thumani, he says, O oh Allah, akhrij hubba dunya min qalbi, remove the love of this dunya from my heart. You know, and it is not the life or the, 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 the dunya of the mu'mineen, no, the dunya al akhirah. Dunya is a place where you start, you know, farming for your akhirah. So yeah. in that sense, dunya is great because that's where you achieve all the rewards. Like I mean, the means to achieve all the rewards. So it's great. The problem is when people start, you know, not themselves owning their palaces, but the palaces start owning yeah. them. Not themselves owning their, their cars, the cars start owning them. They don't own their money, the money start owning them. You know, an example is given is like money and wealth is like, uh, 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 to, to the heart, is like a sh water and the ship. Yeah. Water is a blessing to the ship, you know, until it gets, start getting inside the ship. You know, once it starts getting inside, inside the ship, then it becomes a curse. Yeah. You know, a same thing, money is a blessing. The Prophet says, you know, earn money. It's good. The best aid to enhance the belief in Allah is wealth, money. Yeah. You need money to build hospitals, orphanages, schools, yes. and so on and so yes. forth. You need money for this. So Islam wants people to become rich. And that's why if we go back to the early uh, talk, earlier talk, Imams wanted to people, for people to become independent, become owners, becomes, become businessmen. You know, Imam al-Sadiq tells people that nine-tenth of the risk of the sustenance is in business. So people who are employed, all these millions of people yeah. who are employed, they're settling for one-tenth, you know, 10% of the, of the risk. So that's what Imam must, but at the same time, don't let this money get inside the heart. You know, use it as a means, just like water, to, to sail. Mm. You know, sail for the akhirah. But the problem, what we see with what this brother is mentioning is, is that this is the simple problem. The problem is people don't realize that there will be one day there will be a day that where they will be held accountable for every single word they said yeah. and every deed yeah. they made. And so that's unfortunate because of their love of their dunya has made them blind, you know, about the akhirah. Um, also, uh, because of what you said about people being owned by their palaces, I know the famous saying of Imam Ali alayhi salam that um, Zahid is not that you own nothing, but that nothing owns you. Ahsanti, barakallah. Um, <laughs> that's right. Um, also, uh, we've just got five minutes, but also another point I wanted to make about uh, this leads on to another definition of tarot, of, of, of oppression, of tyranny, where it says the tarot is that which is worship besides Allah, worship besides Allah. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and of course, um, worship can also mean serving. I mean, peop rather than people having their wealth serving them, they, they serve their wealth. They mm -hmm. live to, to serve their wealth or yes. their, their material possessions. Yeah, Allah says in another ayah, those who take their desire as their ilah, you know, their own desires, yeah. they become their gods. So they become the slaves of dunya. That's why Imam Hussein told Hur when he was killed in the battle, he said, congratulations, O Hur, indeed you are a free man like your mother named you. You know, free from what? Free from his desires. He yeah. did not, he did not become the slave of his desires. He became the slave of Allah subhanahu yeah. wa ta'ala. And it's a pride to be the slave of Allah. Allah talks about our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi yeah. in Surah Al-Isra, the first ayah, Subhana alladhi asra bi abadihi laylan. Praise be the one, glorify be he the one who 
took the night journey or enabled his, his servant to take the night journey from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. His servant. So he refers to Rasulullah as his abd, his servant. Yeah. And, and our prophets, and they love that. Uh, the, the prophets, the imams, uh, Isa alayhi salam, the first word, Jesus, he, that he spoke said, Qala inni abdullah. I am the servant of Allah. So this is the problem. When people do not free themselves from the love of this dunya, they become the slaves of yeah. dunya. You know, and that's what Imam Hussein referred to, Anas Abidud Dunya. People are the slaves of this dunya. So this is the problem. When people start taking these, uh, worshipping their money, worshipping, you know, they're making the money as the God. And reputation, I mean, as in, I mean, this is something perhaps, inshallah, we can talk about it. Um, another time, but the, the difference between protecting your honor and, and kind of worshipping your reputation or serving your reputation. Yeah. I mean, there's differences it's, in It's there. all, a person has to really ask himself one question or herself one question every single time. Is that this thing I'm doing right now, is Allah pleased with yeah. or not pleased with? Am I going to be able to answer this thing I'm doing right now on the Day of Judgment or not? This is a, if yes, خلاص, then do it. Go ahead and don't worry about anything else. If not, that's when you stop and do tawbah. Right. Thank you. Um, and just one uh, a point as well that uh, uh, I wanted to make again as you're talking about us, uh, uh, exclusively serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a way towards being free. And uh, there's this other um, narration from Imam Baqir alayhi salam where he says, um, whoever prefers obedience to Allah over the anger of the people will be protected by Allah against the jealousy of any jealous ones and the oppression of any oppressors. Allah will be his assistant and supporter. Um, I mean, what we can see in this is that it requires um, tawakkul and, and courage, mm -hmm. um, not to allow yourself to be oppressed by the opinions of other people or you know, the oppressive attitudes of, of other people, or the jealousy of other people. Ahsanti, this is exactly what I just mentioned, that a person has to always ask himself or herself this question. This, you know, some people tell me that we've been invited to a wedding, it's a family wedding. It's a misgathering, there are not, people not wearing hijab, it's not really Islamic, but it's embarrassing not to go there. Yeah. You know, what will they think of us? It's, it's, it's shameful. I tell them, who, who should you be ashamed of, Allah or, or your, 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 your relatives yes. there? Yeah. So, so this is the thing, every action, everything a person does, has to ask himself this very honest question. That's why Imam Rada says, do your self, you know, uh, assessment before it is done for you. Yeah. Assess yourselves before they, they assess it for you. Weigh your deeds before they're weighed for you. So ask yourself, uh, this thing I'm doing, this wedding I'm going to go to, this work I'm going to do, this uh, uh, website that I'm seeing right now, is Allah pleased with it? Can I defend it on the Day of Judgment? If yes, go ahead. Okay. If not, خلص. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent program, Sheikh Osama al Atar, And inshallah, he will be here for the next few nights as well. And uh, thank you for watching and thank you very much for your calls and keep smiling. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.